I thought I would uh, change up a little scenery and get down among you. Is that okay today? Uh, get a little closer. Uh, hopefully, those in spitting range, all right, watch yourself, okay? Uh, won't get too fired up today. We are on our third week here of our, our series. We've been uh, trying to challenge ourselves and really welcome um, the ability to, to ask the, the questions, why? Um, why isn't God close to me? Uh, why doesn't God seem fair? All these kind of questions, why does God seem to be out of touch and disconnected with my life right now? And I, if you're like me, there's been times and seasons in your life where you felt like, I don't really feel God right now. And so what I'm going to do is kind of walk through maybe some reasons why we don't always feel God. If you're taking notes, I'd love to you kind of follow along. Um, let me just kind of, first of all, explain what we mean by feel. Because the misunderstanding here is that God is always supposed to make us sense Him. That we're supposed to always be just pouring our eyes out, that we're always supposed to have goosebumps, that we're always supposed to just have this, this constant stirring. And uh, the reality is, the longer you're saved, the, the more you realize that that's not the way God works. If we're to mature, at some point, God has to kind of step back. And, and what I mean by that is not step out of our lives, but what He does, it's just like a, a child that you're raising. At some point, that 12-year-old kid has to get off the milk. Amen? At some point, you realize that that child that you're raising can't just be nourished by, even if it's mama's milk. At some point, they need to begin to eat uh, meat. They need to begin to eat other things. As my mom said, now, my mom's five foot three. I was born, I was nine pounds and two ounces. She said, three nights in, the milk wasn't enough. Amen? So cereal came into play. So I've been hungry from day one, okay, or day three, and it just wasn't enough. And so at some point, in order to, to uh, take care of and mature that child, they have to be given things that they're going to have to work to digest and work to chew. Same is true with God. Just because we don't feel Him, just because we don't have that sense that we had that day that we were saved, doesn't mean that God's not engaged in our lives. So let's work through the notes. Why don't I always feel God? Number one, maybe you're over sensationalizing it. Maybe you're over sensation. We're starting with a big word. I promise you they get smaller from here. Okay? I'm not that bright. So Jesus had recently performed this miracle where he fed these thousands of men and women and children with just a snack lunch of, of bread and sardines. And so these same people that he had performed this miracle, you can kind of imagine thousands of people, you're out there, you're listening to some preacher preach a long time. The long he, longer he talks, the more hungry you get. In fact, the disciples were getting hungry and they were getting frustrated. And they were like, hey, there's not a McDonald's, there's not a Chick-fil-A, there's not anything close around here. So why don't we cut this short, Jesus, and let them go get some, something to eat? Jesus recognized that it wasn't really about the people. Yes, they were hungry, but it was the disciples who were starving. They were ready to cut this thing out and say, let's go eat and cut this thing short. But Jesus saw it as an opportunity. He saw it as an opportunity. I want you to get this, that if we're searching for a feeling from God, maybe God is going to test us. Maybe he's going to stretch us. And so what he did is he said to the disciples, go out and find me some food. Find all you can get. And all we know is that there was this little boy, maybe who had a sack lunch his mom sent to him. He may have been the only one who's prepared, or no one else wanted to share. There's a lot of ways you can take this story. Either way, they come back, and he's got this little snack, snack lunch, and Jesus says, let me pray over this. And you can imagine the disciples going, yeah, right. That's not even going to feed Peter, much less everybody else. And all of a sudden, as they begin to serve, you know the story begins to multiply. And they had leftovers. And so fast forward, that food faded. Jesus goes, and he distances himself. He's going to go on and do some more ministry somewhere else. And the same crowd follows him, and they catch up to him. And they're looking for what, do you think? They're looking for more teachings and more, more uh, doctrine and more church services. No, they're looking for more food. In fact, this is what they said in John chapter 6, verse 30. He says, so they asked him, they're asking Jesus, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? And here's the question. What will you do? And maybe that's you right now. Maybe you've come to a point in your life where either maybe you haven't given your life to Christ, you haven't put your faith in Him, or you're going through something that's causing you to 
to have doubts that God is fully engaged and He's fully in control. And you're looking for God to fix it. You're saying, God, if you're real, then prove yourself. If you're real, fix this. But what if Jesus says, I've already shown you enough. I've already done enough to prove my existence to you. It's time for you to grow up. It's time for you at some point to have enough faith to trust me. You see, to this point, the Jewish people thought that the Messiah, and that this wasn't anything in the, in the prophecies, this was kind of their own doing, they believed that in the coming Messiah would perform some of the same miracles that Moses had performed. One of those was manna would fall from heaven. And so what they're waiting for, even though Jesus produced this miracle of food, which was essentially the same thing, they were waiting on this specific thing. And here's what we do sometimes. We pray things like, God, if you'll just do this, if you'll cause this to happen, if you'll fix my finances, if you'll fix my relationship, if you'll fix this problem, if you'll fix this disease, then I will trust you. I will, I will put my faith in you. Really what we're wanting for him, we're wanting exactly what these people were seeking him for. And if you go on in that story, what you find is Jesus says, hey, I'm not here to baby you. You see, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to die. You're going to have to die to yourself. You're going to have to die to your feelings. You're going to have to die to your own plans and all the things you have. And so the question is for today, why don't I feel God? Maybe it's because he wants us to grow up. Maybe he wants us to stop seeking him for a feeling or a stirring. And maybe he just wants us to trust him and just begin to serve him no matter what we feel and trust that he's there regardless of how we feel. The next thing we kind of look at, why don't I always feel God, is maybe you're simply distracted. Anybody ever been distracted? Some of you are kind of there now, right? I mean, you're just like, what, what's for lunch and all this kind of stuff? And so you're fighting all these things, and maybe it was a distraction for you to get here today. You had all these things that you could have done, but you decided to be here, and I'm, I'm thankful that you are. But Jesus has this, this meal, and he hangs out with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. This is a family that he built a great friendship with and on the way to Jerusalem back to Galilee and back and forth he made these trips in his ministry and he just built a relationship with them and they became friends and he's sitting around like he would have any normal day and you have two ladies you have one lady who's recognizing the importance of spending time with him you have another lady who's trying to feed everybody and this is kind of where we pick up the story in Luke chapter 10 verse 38 as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was, what does that say? Distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Now, we all understand what distractions are, right? Right? I mean, distractions can be good things. We're not just talking about distractions of bad things and the things we shouldn't be doing. What we're looking at is what Martha was busy doing was a worthy thing to be doing. Right, Miss Francis? Okay? It was all about, I would call Francis out because she's our, our main person, right? That's just, if there's a meal that happens, it has to go through Miss Francis. And so when you think about all this stuff that's happening, this meal and the preparations and all that's going into that, there had to be somebody organizing it. And can you imagine Martha in the kitchen? You imagine every time she walked through to check who wants this, who wants that. Well, somebody needs to hold the onion. Somebody doesn't like this. And somebody wants their steak well done. or somebody. All this kind of details. She cared about the disciples. She cared about Jesus. And she wants to make everything perfect because she recognizes who he is. But she also recognizes that the way that she can serve him is to what? Serve him. But all of a sudden, Martha gets upset and says, why don't you tell Mary to help me? Now here's where we begin to figure out how do we determine what's good and then what's best. I can't speak for a lot of things in your life. You're the only one who can determine when it's time to leave your work, when it's time to shut the phone off, when it's time to cut the TV off, when it's time to shut it down and spend time with your family, when it's time to, hey, you've got to push through and you've got to grind out at your job. There's hobbies that you're doing just to kind of, you know, just have your own time and all that. You're the only one that knows when it's time to unplug and manage, and I pray that you get all those priorities in order before it's too late. But what I'm talking about here is the distraction that's keeping us from spending time with Jesus. And so I'll just throw a simple question out there. Is there anything in our life 
that we're putting ahead of our time with Him. Maybe a reason we're not sensing a, a fresh stirring, and it's been a while since we felt God stir our heart to do something or to change something or just to love on us is because every time God has called us to open up our Bible app or to open up our Bible or go out in the woods or go out on the back porch or go somewhere and just get away and get along with Him, what if every time He's called out to us, we've said, in a minute. Anybody ever been guilty of that? Your pastor has. In a minute. Let me check this email. Let me, let me make this call. Let me, send, let me send this text. Let me go run this errand. What if God is wanting to draw us unto Himself to give us some information, to show us some love, but we say, in a minute. In a minute. There's a quote by Joanne Wolfgang von Goeth. I'm sure that's right. You can check it later. Said this, Things which matter most must never be at the mercy of things which matter least. Bottom line is God must be first. And I pray that's the case. Why don't I always feel God? If you're taking notes, maybe your heart has hardened. Maybe your heart has hardened. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Now, here's what I want to say about hardening our hearts. How does that happen? How, how does the hardening, and I got to think about hardening our hearts and hardening our skin. I don't, I don't pick up a shovel right, too often, but when I do, right, you know what happens to the hands? Anybody? Any, anybody want to admit you don't use a shovel a ton? Okay. And you get the calluses, right? And that's a way for, you know, damage has been done to our skin. And what is our skin? Because our great designer designed it that way. He says, I'm going to form a callus to protect that skin and for it to heal underneath. All right, that, that's how that works. That's how our skin works. But let me just say, our heart is different. You see, our first reaction, our first natural response, when people fail us, and they will, when the church fails us, and we will. At some point when we put our faith in someone or something other than God Himself, we will face disappointment. And our first reaction is to protect our heart. Someone breaks our heart, what do we do? We try to push everyone else away instead of pulling them close. You see, that's our nature. And what God is saying, He wants us to understand that people will fail us. There are times the church will hurt us, and maybe you're here today and you're giving the church another shot. There's been a church out there, they, they hurt you, somebody said something, somebody did something, they, they, they passed something, or they, you had a preacher there that you loved, and the church decided it, it was time for him to go, and all these sorts of things, and you just, you had your trust, and it was built in the church. And there's nothing wrong with that. But understand that our trust in people and our trust in organizations and our trust even in the church that's led hopefully by godly people cannot take the place of our trust in God. Because we need to understand up front that we will be hurt by people, we will be hurt by organizations because we all bring our own expectations in. But our hearts must remain soft. Our hearts must remain pliable. So whatever happens, we're calling on God and we're not pushing others away. Well, I don't always feel God. Maybe you built a wall of sin. Let's get real here. You see, sometimes it's our own doing. Sometimes it's not about God drawing us unto Himself, wanting us to trust Him more. What if it's about a choice or a series of choices we continue to make to push Him away? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says this. Listen. The Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is His ear too deaf to hear you call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, He has turned away and will not listen anymore. Now, what does that mean? That first part, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is His ear too weak or too deaf to hear you. What that simply means is there's no distance you can go that's too far away from God's reach. It doesn't matter how far you run, God's hand can reach you. It doesn't matter how far you run, how many earmuffs you put on, how hardened your heart is, or your calloused your heart becomes, it doesn't matter, God's voice can still penetrate your ear. 
And what I hope, and there's twofold in this, first of all, there's people that you're praying for. There are people that you're praying, God, don't give up on them. You know what? God is never going to give up on anybody. He's never given up. Until we breathe our last breath, there's still hope. Someone said? Amen. There's still hope. Keep praying. Keep reaching. Keep witnessing. But in the midst of that, what does that other part say? Is that while God's voice will keep shouting, while God's arm will keep reaching, and you can look at the, the story of Jonah and find out how far and how amazing God will go and the distances He will go and the crazy things He will do to try to reach His people and get His message across, He will go to the ends of the earth, earth to reach one person. But it all comes down to our free will. You see, God can only convict us. We're the only ones who can turn our ear and turn our hearts away from that sin that's holding us captive and turn our eyes and our hearts back to the one who died for us and wants to live in us. And I pray that today, if you're not feeling God because of your own sin, that you listen and that you turn today and you make things right with Him. He's calling. He's reaching. And then lastly, why, why don't I always feel God is maybe you don't know God. You see, the, the sheep recognize the shepherd's voice. And if you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never admitted that you needed Him, that you were sinful, then maybe today is the day that you say, you know what, I don't feel God because I don't know Him and He doesn't know me. And let's walk through and let's kind of wrap this up with the present promises because God promises to reveal Himself to us. He promises to live within us. He promises to live around us. He is omniscient, so He is everywhere at all times in His complete being. And so what are those promises we can expect? If we understand and we've tried to maybe, and I, I hope that the Holy Spirit has maybe, maybe shown you and revealed to you today, maybe if you haven't felt Him, if you haven't felt a stirring in a while, maybe you could kind of examine and the Holy Spirit's shown you there's, there's a reason. Maybe you've distanced yourself because of sin. Maybe you've hardened your heart because someone or something has hurt you or disappointed you. And you've kind of distanced. You've done that. Or maybe God wants you to grow up. You've been a Christian for so long, but when's the last time that He really stretched you? When's the last time you really did anything that required a level of faith greater than what you've done in the past? And God is just simply wanting to draw you closer to Himself. But here's the promises, a couple of them that I want you to understand. Number one, you will find God... When you seek God. Jeremiah 29, 13, 14 says this. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And I will be found by you. I love this. Declares the Lord. You see, God delights in revealing himself to you. He sent his son so that we could know him, not just to know about him. The Holy Spirit didn't just come to live around us. The Holy Spirit came to live within us. How many of you played hide-and-go-seek when your kids were small? I don't know if you still play when the kids are big. I don't know. You, you're not going to be the cool parent, I promise you, okay? If you're having a 13-year-old uh, birthday party sleepover, don't do the hide-and-go-seek thing. It probably won't go over well. But when Trinity was young, she said, we played this hide-and-go-seek, right? And you know how it goes. It was more about them finding you than you finding them, okay? There were periods of time where we'd play hide-and-go-seek, and I would know exactly where she was. And the fun part was calling out and giving this, these cues and saying, I'm coming, but then the cool part was when I would hide from her. Now, here's the part you don't get until you're a parent. The fun part wasn't hiding and remaining hidden, the fun part was watching the look on their face when they found you. And it depends on what age they were. They would be going around and they may pass you and they may even see a glimpse of you, but you knew they couldn't find you. So what would you do if you wanted them to find you? You would make noises, right? Yep. Trinity. And there's an old movie I would quote. Look up here. Look up here. 
And then all these kind of these noises, you're trying to get her attention, you're trying to say, I'm over here, and then all of a sudden she would find you, and then there's that look on her face of, I found you. And there's that joy. And there's a parent who's like, oh man, that was exciting. I want, I want that feeling again. And now she's 15, and if I say, hey, let's go play hide and go seek, it's like, phew. Yeah, right. The only way we could play hide and go seek at my house is hide her phone. And then we have to go find that. You know what I mean? It would work the same way for me. I'm going to be in trouble when I get home. I think we brought two cars since the in-laws are in town, so I'll ride with them. Here's the deal, though, guys. God delights. He delights in allowing us to find Him. So you feel like, I don't, I don't feel God. I don't... When's the last time you just kind of listened for his cues? What, what if you're the one <laughs> that he wants to reveal himself to, but he's wanting you to work a little bit for it? He's wanting you to dig into Scripture a little bit deeper. He's wanting you to spend a few more minutes in prayer with him. He's wanting you to go through some kind of suffering. He's wanting you to go through something to just remind you of how good he is. Doesn't God feel so good at the end of a hardship? And what if? What if that hardship or that season you're going through, it wasn't necessarily caused by God, but God's going to use that to reveal Himself at the end of it so that you can recognize how good He's been and how faithful He's been in the midst of all that you've been through. Number two. You can do life with God's presence. And I want you to get this. Not only will you find Him when you seek Him, but you can do life with God's presence. That there's an invitation that He has, is extending you. And John 14, 16-17 says this, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate. Who is He talking about here? He's talking about the Holy Spirit, who will never leave you. In verse 17, he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you do because he lives with you now and will and later will be in you. Let me just newsflash here. We're in that later part. You see, Jesus was living among them and he was praying for us in this prayer. He was praying that one day we would recognize that God and His presence is all around us. It's all about the nature. It's all about everything that's going. We're, we're daily, if we would just take a breath, if we would just take a moment and open our eyes every once in a while and just recognize that there's nothing that happens that, that doesn't reveal His glory. The, the trees and this time of the year where everything is blooming, everything is coming to life, and all the stuff that comes with that, God is reminding us of how beautiful He is. And He wants us to allow Him to be part of every area of our life. Maybe the reason why we don't necessarily feel a stirring within us more often, what if there are areas in our life that we have not given God control of? Maybe we're struggling in one area, whether it's our parenting, whether it's our marriage, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a ministry you're involved in, or you're trying to reach someone. What if our business is struggling? What if there's something in our life that we're just not seeing the fruits of our labor simply because we're not allowing God to have control of it? We're trying to fix all the problems. We're trying to fix all the people. And was the last time we just asked God, is there anything in my life that I'm holding back from you? Is there anything that I'm allowing to distract me? If there's any sin within me that's keeping me from, from growing in you, is there anything that I'm putting before you? Is there anyone that I'm putting before you? I know that God's going to reveal Himself. But what if today, and this is all about us, finally open our eyes and say, God, I see you in this. I recognize you in the suffering. I recognize you in the pain. 
I recognize you in this moment. And maybe I'm struggling in this because I haven't given you control of this. You bow your heads with me. God, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you so much for your amazing power, the strength that we gain from you. But if we've ever asked this question and wonder, wonder why there's times that we don't feel you, we don't sense a fresh stirring and a move within our hearts. It's been a while since we shed a tear because we've been moved by you. It's been a while since we felt you tug our hearts to witness to someone. It's been a while since we felt you tug our hearts to, to give a little bit more of ourselves to further your kingdom. It's been a while since we've exercised any amount of faith. We're just going through the same motions, doing the same thing that we've been doing for a long time. And we wonder why we haven't felt you. Maybe it's because we're holding back. Maybe it's because you want more of us. I pray that today and in this moment that we recognize that there's not a season in life where we couldn't use more of you. That we'd never get to a place in this life where we don't need all of you in every area of our life. If there's sin, call it out in us, God. Help us to repent, turn from it today. Surround ourselves with people who will hold us accountable. If it's about priorities, if it's about us doing things, spending time or resources on other things and other people that we should be spending on you and your work, God, show us. If our hearts have been hardened because we've been hurt, we're just simply trying to protect ourselves, help us just to forgive, move on, and understand that truly is part of life, unfortunately. That the only one we can trust is you. If you're here today and we talked about maybe you don't know God, maybe that's why you haven't felt Him. But maybe for the first time you're feeling a tug on your heart today. And it's either about Him wanting to do something in you to stir you to action. Convict you of a sin. Or maybe it's about drawing you unto Himself. If that's you today, you want to invite Him into your life, I'd love to pray that prayer with you today. Anyone, just lift your hand. 